My name is Richard Dworczyn. I am a political Hello. affairs analyst at Politica Insight. And for the next discussion, who and what uh, and for what purpose is winning the global disinformation war, I'm going to talk to Anneli Ahonen, head of East Stratcom Task Force of the Ex European External Action Service. Welcome. Hello. Hi. For, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be with you uh, here today. And again, before we start our discussion, I'm going to encourage the viewers to ask question, uh, questions as early as possible so that we can ask them uh, during the, at, at the end of our discussion. Now, uh, two weeks ago, East Stratcom Task Force celebrated publishing its uh, 200th weekly disinformation review. This is a, a document in which, you doc, uh, in which you look at many examples of Russian disinformation against the European Union. And the fact that we have to counter uh, Russian disinformation is nothing new. But the European Union has been quite vocal lately uh, about naming China as, in, as the other main source of disinformation. So I wanted to ask you what has changed or what really has changed recently or have we just been slow to respond to what has changed earlier? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and yes, truly, it, it's a celebration of our uh, 200 uh, disinformation review. Uh, which is a which is a nice moment from from our point of view. Um, there is already quite a long track record and history uh, for the European Union to address uh, Russia's disinformation and pro Kremlin disinformation, as you um, mentioned, where where this work started in 2015 with the well-known background um, of uh, much more clear understanding. Uh, how the war in Ukraine, um, illegal annexation of Crimea uh, and shooting down MH17 were all used um, uh, or disinformation was uh, widely used uh, to gain uh, some uh, po political uh, goals uh, by Russia. Uh, and from then on, uh, the, the issue of disinformation and the challenge uh, and also understanding um, of it uh, in the European Union level uh, has become much more uh, wider. So there are like uh, different work strands with the European Commission who work with the social media companies uh, uh, to uh, track how they are tackling disinformation, how they are promoting authoritative uh, content uh, and so on through the code of practice. Uh, what really changed uh, with the COVID-19, where when Europe um, uh, and all countries globally faced uh, a totally new crisis, uh, is how disinformation uh, can really have a direct impact uh, on people's lives. Uh, and from there, uh, there is a growing understanding that there is of the urgency of the issue, uh, that something needs to be done uh, very soon. Um, as if we can already see, there are some studies that indicate that, for example, if a person believes and claims that the COVID-19 is an um, artificially man-made virus or originates uh, in a US military lab, uh, all frequent claims by Russia's disinformation, um, then this person is also uh, less likely to follow uh, any health advice. Uh, to wash your hands, uh, to keep the social distancing, um, and so on. Uh, so I think that this urgency uh, came um, from clear understanding uh, of the health impacts uh, of COVID-19 disinformation. Uh, and clearly, uh, China has been a player uh, in the disinformation field, uh, of course, earlier. Its tactics have uh, and strategies have differed uh, from the ones that Russia has been using, especially when it comes to uh, and Europe. Uh, but during the, the coronavirus crisis, uh, what we have clearly seen is uh, that uh, there is a, a clear overlap uh, of Russia's uh, and Chinese uh, interests and, and the ways uh, how they are using disinformation. So, for example, both um, 
like outlets or channels from both countries use very similar messages uh, about uh, uh, like misleading the people to believe that the, uh, the virus actually originates in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, biological weapon laboratory. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the fact that with the epidemic, the impact of the d disinformation has changed uh, in very much. But do you believe that apart from that, have we seen uh, a qualitative change of how disinformation is spread or is it uh, just a quantitative change? Do we just have more disinformation, more fake news or are they radically different? No, I think that, that, that in a way, the, the, the types and ways how disinformation spreads are, are basically uh, the same uh, always. So they, they build on existing uh, conspiracy theories uh, about, for example, the claims about um, U.S. biological weapon laboratories is, a, is an old, old uh, conspiracy theory. Uh, trope that that is circulating and then surfacing uh, in a certain moment when it's uh, when it's useful for the for the one who seeks to disinform. Um, so I would not say that these are completely new types or like much more sophisticated types of um, of fakes. But uh, clearly there are there are issues that make uh, make these old. Uh, techniques and old methods uh, much more impactful than before uh, when there is also at the same time the development of uh, possible vaccination um, uh, happening and uh, and and clearly um, disinformers are using anti-vaccination uh, messages uh, very widely. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to ask you a question which is hidden in the uh, in our uh, topic of, of discussion. Who is winning the global disinformation war and what actually a win would mean? What does it mean for the countries and other entities that are spreading the disinformation? And what does it mean for the countries and entities that are fighting against it? Well, I would divide my answer to this question into into two parts. Uh, so, part of the uh, of this uh, battle of uh, narratives has also been um, Russia's and China's uh, promotion of the authoritarian model and its efficiency in fighting uh, COVID nineteen. Um, presenting that uh, model as a superior to democracies. Uh, so in the end, I think that that is what is at stake here. Uh, and, and on the other hand, uh, I think that the, there is very uh, clear understanding uh, that only through uh, that a democ democratic society it is much more strong and much more well equipped uh, to tackle this kind of crisis uh, than an authoritarian model uh, and only that only through international cooperation it's possible uh, to to win this this battle uh, and then when it comes to like more specific examples of uh, of, of who is winning and how and where um, one part of uh, of foreign countries like Russia's and China's uh, communication campaigns has been more uh, traditional propaganda of uh, of their support uh, also to the to EU countries like for example Italy uh, and at the same time attacking the the European solidarity and and uh, creating more more divisions also with uh, with a certain disinformation elements like that the EU would not have done anything in Italy uh, which is clearly untrue um, and here you could see that uh, in the beginning, for example, in the countries where Stratcom uh, works uh, to uh, improve um, EU's own communication to, to show the benefits uh, of cooperation with the EU in the Eastern Partnership, uh, meaning Ukraine, Belarus, uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia um, and Moldova. Uh, so in some countries like 
fairly surveys this spring showed that uh, China had been very efficiently uh, sending its message about uh, the assistance that, that China gives. Um, and, and the figures showed how people were widely believing that, that China is, is one of the major donors. Uh, and then through this efficient EU communication, now the figures have flipped uh, and the audiences again understand uh, where the actual support comes. Um, when the EU is is uh, is the biggest uh, supporter um, and and uh, giving assistance to this region, uh, so I think that definitely there is uh, hope uh, and 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 we should not um, uh, give up to the idea that uh, that now uh, disinformation is so widespread uh, that we are losing uh, this battle. Uh, I wanted to ask you one more thing, because. Yeah. I believe that we have a tendency to focus on external threats in terms of disinformation, but what about internal threats? Maybe this is a smaller pro problem in Europe, but if you take a look at the United States, then uh, I'm going to quote uh, CNN, which has counted that between January 27th and May 3rd, Donald Trump made 654 uh, false statements, out of which 20, uh, 215 were directly linked to the pandemic. So how do we fight the threats within? Yes, that is a very good question. Uh, and the easy answer uh, to that from my side, of course, is that uh, we have the mandate from the EU uh, member states, from the European Council to tackle uh, foreign disinformation, especially Russia's disinformation. Uh, but the more uh, like the wider answer uh, to this is that there, there can be also different ways mm -hmm. to uh, to tackle this information uh, mm -hmm. and not every part of the uh, answer mm -hmm. has to come from governments uh, or institutions like the EU. Uh, so um, the civility, the journalists, uh, as you uh, fact checkers, um, these can be also um, uh, crucial, playing crucial role uh, in tackling domestic disinformation. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to go to questions from the audience right now. Uh, I invite uh, all the viewers to ask more questions, but uh, for now I'm going to ask you a question from Anna Kanjorak, who asks, have the EU institutions thought about the appropriate program of delivering information about the EU uh, in the European countries? Maybe uh, there should be some programs of uh, educational matter for the journalists. In Poland, I have a feeling that journalist, uh, journalists also don't understand the insights. Uh, well, surely there is... Um more need, like the need to do more, uh, but in general, uh, I think that the, the European Commission's representation in in each of the uh, EU member states uh, is the best place to start with, uh, familiar, like familiarizing yourself with the with the European Union, uh, and the representations are are doing uh, a lot of work uh, uh, to make this happen. Mm -hmm. uh now, I would like to ask you about uh, the most uh, efficient European response to external disinformation. What do you believe are the most efficient ways of combating fake news? Uh, I think that um, no, there is no silver bullet to, to fight disinformation. I think that we have to have all the different elements in place at the same time so that they work well together. We have to have uh, a clear political support and mandate uh, uh, to do this job as we have with Russia. We have to have, um, uh, we have, to have the ability to expose disinformation publicly um, so that uh, there is a clear statement uh, and, and a digital trace uh, when, when that, that counters uh, these claims. 
Uh, we also need to strengthen the media literacy programs at schools. We need to uh, have the more resources to, to journalism, quality journalists, uh, which is even more, more crucial now after um, COVID-19 or during COVID-19 uh, crisis when, uh, when uh, so many media are suffering um, seriously. Uh, also, also due to, to the fi financial side. Uh, of the crisis. Um, we need to have the fact checkers uh, doing their part and we clearly need to have the social media companies fully uh, on board uh, with this uh, so that the uh, so that the um, abusing them uh, to spread uh, disinformation or to to uh, foreign actors to abuse them uh, to distort the public uh, debate uh, in the EU uh, could be eventually uh, prevented. Uh, thank you. I'm told that Piotr Svitalski from the uh, Warsaw Bureau of the European Commission has joined us to tell us briefly about what the uh, what the representation ha uh, what the office has done uh, to fight disinformation. Uh, good good afternoon, Piotr. The e floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. I will be speaking English just to continue from my predecessor. I am Polish. I can speak Polish, uh, but I will speak English. Anyway, uh, great question that Anna Kanjorek asked and um, that was partially already answered. Um, yes, the EU, uh, the EC, European Commission representations in the member states have the mandate to inform about the actions of the EU. However, one must remember that the main responsibility on the information policy about the European Union, its benefits of the membership, lie within the member states. But uh, to answer Ms. Kinjorek's question, yes, we do have contacts with the press. We organize seminars. We are here available at any time to answer the questions and, uh, and deliver information. But to be more specific, during the pandemic, um, uh, we've seen, uh, just like in Italy or, or Spain or France or outside of the EU in, in, the, in the remit where the East Stratcom task force has their mandate, so in the, in the, in the Eastern neighborhood, we've seen an unprecedented scale of, of disinformation, of fake information about the European Union or, or about the lack of action from the European Union. Um, and what has happened uh, just to give you uh, some some inside knowledge and some some information, uh, the Director General for Communication (DGCom), uh, which is directly under President von der Leyen, has uh, created informal um, task forces uh, that were partially based, or part of the teams of the task forces were based inside uh, the DigiCom in Brussels and part of the teams were based in the representation. So there was a task force for Italy created, there was a task force for Poland created, there was a task force uh, created uh, for German speaking countries, a task force for Spain, for Czech and Slovakia. They joined on this project together after splitting in the 90s. <laughs> but um, these task forces proved very, very um, crucial in in fighting rapidly spreading disinformation or rather answering questions that could lead to false beliefs claims and um, and um, and we were able through this task force which consisted of members both in the headquarters and in on the ground to quickly access information on be it on health issues on equipment issues on um, blockages of um, uh, shipments uh, within the uh, internal market. So uh, these task forces quickly responded uh, with, uh, with crucial information. Perfect example was that we could create very quickly uh, simple but engaging infographics on what is true and what is false when it comes to EU and the fight against the virus. So, so the claim that the EU has failed or, or is acting slowly was one of the main misinformations presented by, by various actors, internal actors, I mean, um, by providing 
clear and and very simple infographics we were able to to hopefully countermeasure those this mis misinformation so just a short intervention from the warsaw office uh, and what is being done uh, to fight disinformation on the eu in the member states in poland thank you very much piotr uh, so let's get back to anneli ahonen uh, i wanted to uh, ask you one final question as the head of east stratcom task force uh, does the EU need to strengthen uh, its soft power to help fight disinformation? Say, do we need a global Stratcom task force or maybe something like Russia Today, but European? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I think that uh, there has actually been this discussion in the past if if the EU should have um, sort of its own uh, centralized uh, broadcast um, TV channel um, to uh, you know to to better deliver the messages. Uh, and this idea never really uh, went through and and I personally I am actually quite glad that it didn't uh, didn't happen because I think that um, the more like the, the most efficient way uh, for the EU to 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 tackle this issue is is to make sure that there is a clear like wider framework uh, to understand the security aspects uh, of the disinformation challenge, how it's used uh, within the, the with, like within hybrid operations, and then on the other hand uh, to to separate the issues uh, of misinformation, misleading information, uh, where media literacy is the best uh, tool to tackle it, um, and. And there, like this one centralized TV channel that would deliver you messages, um, I don't think it really, I don't think it really, really uh, like fits uh, the actual challenge that we are uh, facing. Um, so the solution has to be comprehensive, but it has to be also very local, so that uh, that like the EU improves its own own communication, fact-based communication, delivers its, uh, the, the messages uh, efficiently within the local circumstances. And that was Anneli Ahonen. Thank you very much for your insights. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. <laughs>